Feast TV is brought to you with support from Missouri Wines, Whole Foods Market, La Col Culinaire, The Raphael Hotel, and New Season Spa and Salon. In this episode, we are dipping into chocolate in all of its luxurious forms. I'm Kat Neville, and this is Feast TV. Our first stop on our tour of chocolate is here at Cacao, and we are at Brian Pelletier, the Chocolatier's Maplewood location. Tell me a little bit about your process of, of how you develop these beautiful confections. Well, we start with ideas, and we start with, uh, with different recipes that we have, and build on those. We're trying to add uh, local ingredients using locally roasted coffee. Um, local beer, local lavender, local herbs, things from the market. And local wine. And local wine. We're making some, some little fruit shells with that right now. I think people are getting um, more educated. They're looking for things that are good and interesting. Um, they're looking for high quality. They're looking for, um, for great ingredients. So I think people are looking for something that, uh, that tastes great and maybe challenges their taste buds a little bit. Everything is so beautifully put together and it's very refined, but at the same time, it's the kind of thing that you just want another bite and another bite. You just well, keep going back to it. And that's, I mean, that's what we're doing here. We're giving them one at a time. Mm -hmm. um, we like to say there's a lot of love that goes into each of the pieces that we make here. And I think that, I think that shows when people try it. Yeah. We use three different chocolates on a day-to-day -day basis. One of them is American, one is Swiss, and one is Belgian. And we're um, combining those in different proportions depending on what we're making. But then we're also using things like Askinosi chocolate or Patrick chocolate, where we can really showcase the flavor that they're making in that bean-to-bar, really small batch stuff that's, that's really special. So we have a treat for you. We're actually going to be able to take you down to Springfield to meet Sean Eskinozzi in person and see his bean to bar process in action. Let's head there now. I am here with Sean Askinozzi in Springfield, Missouri at the home of Askinozzi Chocolate. When you walk into the factory, that rich aroma of roasting chocolate just hits you. Sean, your chocolates are known across the country, across the world. I mean, they really are some of the most highly regarded artisan chocolates made today. Tell me a little bit of your backstory, because you didn't start out in chocolate. No, I started out in criminal law, yeah. <laughs> which has no aroma to it whatsoever, except some jails do, maybe. I wanted to do something with my hands, I wanted to have a small company, not a big company, and I landed in chocolate, literally. And I'm so happy that I have because one of the things that's really exciting to me about this, this chocolate world has no bottom to the pool. There's nowhere that we can rest our feet and say we've learned the things we need to learn about chocolate because it's constantly changing. Even the masters would agree that there's always something more to learn, and that's one of the exciting things to me about this. So what inspired you to do the single origin chocolates? I'm interested in single origin chocolate because I want to have a relationship with farmers, and I want to highlight what the farmers have grown and the hard work that they've put in in achieving this flavor that you tasted. And you're making a real impact on the lives of these people, like helping to support the school system in the towns that you're visiting. Our little factory of 17 people, we're feeding almost 2,000 kids a day now um, sustainably with no donations. And we have for several years. We're approaching a million meals that we've provided and funded without any donations. That's not about chocolate. But 
It is about chocolate. It's about the chocolate. We hyper laser focus on the quality of our chocolate, like we're trying to do today at our tasting, and say to ourselves, what's wrong with this? What can we fix with this? How can we make this better? Okay, everyone ready? We'll taste the Del Tombo first. But then for as long as it sort of lingers, it kind of turns into that acidic sensation. But there was something right in the beginning that felt like it was out of order. Almost. It really is very, very, very traditional, what's called a Riba Nacional flavor, only grown in Ecuador. It's a completely different flavor than the first chocolate that we tasted. It's so much more mild, and it's not nearly as acidic as the other one. The other thing I'm noticing is the texture, mm -hmm. because like right now, I still have a little bit of chocolate in my mouth. Can you see it? Oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So I have my hairnet on, my earplugs in, my apron on, and my beautiful purple gloves. And I'm about to learn how to mold these Askinosi chocolate bars by hand. Like this. Whoops. Anything else I have to put on? No, but I do have to make you change your gloves after the ears. Oh yeah, now that I've touched my ears, I can't do this. Okay. Basically, I'm going to fill these and then slide them to you. Okay, I think you're ready to move on. If you're ready to move up. I'm ready. To the advanced mode. <laughs> kind of hold it in place. There you go. Ooh, ah! Oh, God. <laughs> you got it, you got it. Oh, I messed it up. I don't know about that one. happened to come on a day when you were having one of your staff meetings and I noticed that you have each person kind of stand up and talk to their co-workers about the piece of the business that they kind of own. We want to make sure we're sharing everything and that people are sharing with each other so that sales people understand what production is doing and production understands sales and social media and marketing and chocolate and it's a very very important part of what we do. When people talk about artisan and say that it's a word that's thrown around and has no meaning now, that is true. But if you saw the way we roast, there's a lot of art to it that really is true. And we're always paying attention to time and temperature of the bean from crop to crop and origin to origin. The current roaster we have that we've had for almost 10 years has no thermostatic control. Oh. So it's like roasting on a campfire. You're the thermostatic basically. control. Yeah. When you get up and you come to work every day, what is it that you take away from that experience? This isn't about chocolate. It's about everything else. It's how can we improve the crop? How can we talk to the farmers about making the fermentation better? How do we make sure that they're using environmentally friendly practices and not clear cutting um, rainforest? Those are things that have everything to do with the chocolate. And if this chocolate isn't perfect, if it isn't something that you want to spend $8, $10, $20 on a chocolate bar, then we are out of balance. Did I have all this planned out before? I had, no, no, I didn't. I didn't have any idea about that. And that's the part that I love about this job. I knew I wanted to be involved in people's lives, but I, I, I did not know how it would really change me. Now we're heading to St. Louis to visit with Bissinger's, which has a massive production facility. Right now, I am at Bissinger's in St. Louis, Missouri. This is a centuries-old company, and behind me, you can see all the folks who are working hard at creating all the confections and chocolate goodies that have made Bissinger's so famous. We're gonna have a chance to put on our lab coats and hair nets and learn how their molasses caramel lollies are made from start to finish. So let's go meet Dave Owens now. What I think is so interesting about the Bissinger story is that the brand has really pulled into the 21st century 
and it's really grown exponentially, but you're still doing everything by hand. Well, not everything. What we've really found is that the, the products, the processes, methodologies that have a very quantifiable impact by someone, a uh, trained artisan such as Kelsey or any of the folks in this department or out in the uh, other production lines, that skill set, when it requires someone to do it by hand or to have a touch point, absolutely. There's other places that it, there was no benefit to it. So mm -hmm. in order to, for us to grow and, and take this company, like you said, at 21st century and beyond, certainly our, our plan is that this the company lives on another 350 years. So there are things that didn't make any sense. We've grown, we've needed to change this process. This is a really good example of the craftsmanship, the hands-on uh, manufacturing process. The next stage is the finish and robing. So here that curtain of chocolate is gonna envelop those berries, giving that really great shell of chocolate. And then what Abby's doing is she's adding a, just a little bit of a decorative component. This is a very simple stripe as we call it. Some of them are very complex, but for berries it's pretty simple. But you'll notice she has to touch each one. This is a task I can't do. The ladies have tried to teach me to stripe. I can't do it. So what is happening? So Kelsey's just getting started uh, to cook the molasses caramel for the lollies. These are the molasses caramel lollies, correct? Yes, yes. And this is a 19th century recipe. Yes. Yeah. So she's going to bring this up to a boil. And this is just a mixture right now of, of rice syrup and sugar. And once it comes to a boil, she'll be able to add the, the molasses, which give it the distinctive flavor and color. The whole process, start to finish here, is about 30, 35 minutes. But the other key thing, of course, is once this caramel's made, it's really not finished. So you can see the color now. Yeah. That, and you can see the viscosity of it because it's, it's hot, so it's not thick, but it's thicker than it was. Mm -hmm. The room is very cold, and this piece of marble is cold. Yeah, because it's cold. kept in here, right. And so what happens when you pour all this hot caramel on top mm -hmm. of it is it starts to pull that yeah, heat it, out, it right? Just, it just sucks it right out. Mm -hmm. and it will get it down in temperature enough so that it can be handled at that point. But what Kelsey's going to do now, she's, she's going to cut it into some manageable pieces so that she can turn it. Pay close attention to what she's doing now. It's going to be a little hard in the beginning to get it going, but once she gets it going, it'll move pretty nicely as a mass. You see how it's starting to get a little light in color, but the mass is coming together. It's also kind of creating long lines of the caramel. She's creating structure inside of it. This caramel's very good the way it is. Mm -hmm. sure. But by doing this, we end up with the right texture. Yeah, the right, just, just the pleasure that you'll have eating that. So the next one, I think we're gonna let you try. Okay. And then just pull it down. Mm hmm Toss it over. Oh my gosh. Pull it down. And then you just pick it up. Yep. Oh, this feels so funky. The temperature is lessening and it's becoming much more dense. Mm -hmm. I just love that it is still done by hand in an old fashioned way. By continuing these types of techniques, we also continue this tribal knowledge that is important. Mm -hmm. So they take this and then they take it out onto the floor. I'm gonna learn how to shape these molasses caramel lollies myself. You're gonna pick one up, uh -huh. and what I do, you have to make sure your stick's all the way up. Okay. Up, make a little mountain, take the palm of your hand, press down. Okay. Flip up. Oh, cool, okay. You wanna press, press. and oh, press it. Flip. Oh, <laughs> oh you waited too long. I waited too long. Kind of? Very good. Kind of, sort of? You're, you're a beginner. You're pretty good for a beginner. <laughs> pretty good for a beginner. We'll let you have to take that one home. How's that? There you go. All right, you're getting it. It just smells so good. Just that chocolate aroma. They're not big. No. Nice. So nice. just like two bites, essentially. Mm. Or one? It's more than that. I mean, it's multiple bites, right? I could make it one bite. You could, but you, it wouldn't be the same experience. By making this multiple bites mm -hmm. and savoring it, oh you have a much better experience than just consuming it. Okay. You know, there's a difference in eating and enjoying and consuming. I can see why this has been, you know, a favorite for over 100 years. Thanks, Dave. 
Well, thank you, Kat. The last stop on our chocolate tour is Christopher Elbow Artisanal Chocolate. This is a chocolatier that is known worldwide for its high, high quality, very sophisticated approach to chocolate making. Let's get back in the back and see how they do it. The very beginning, our first shop was about 400 square feet. It was a bubble restaurant. We just were starting to do a little bit of wholesale and a little bit of mail order. But our, our flagship collection was 21 flavors of bonbons. We didn't have anything else other than that, than our 21 piece collection, um, which is still our, our best selling box to this day. It's kind of your signature look is that beautiful hand painted. Is that something that you started with or did that evolve? How did that Yeah, that was what we started with right out of the gate was the, the signature hand painted, you know, airbrushed uh, look of our, our chocolates. And it's something that I think, you know, really defined our product as we've grown. We've been trying to keep up with demand since day one. We're very dedicated to the small batch handmade process. You know, we feel like that creates the best product that, that could possibly be created. Um, and we don't deviate from that. When I started, we had about eight molds, which uh, was a typical batch size. But now we have upwards of 80. So it's like we're grown, you know, our batch sizes have grown 10 times. Every chocolate takes at least two days to make. Generally, they take three days. The ganache pieces, which are the square pieces, have to, you make the ganache, and then you let it sit overnight. Then you cut it, let it sit overnight again, and then you enrobe it on the third day. And uh, so those are the ones that always take at least three days to make. If there's anything about Christopher Elbow chocolates, is that they look perfect. They look like tiny little jewels, and I've always been amazed by that. It's, uh, it has always, that's a testament to Christopher's undying standards. He's passed those on to all of us. The Christopher Elbow brand, it really, is very elegant, it's very refined. When you walk into the store, you're struck by the, just how minimalist it is. The packaging is very sophisticated as well, it's just gorgeous. And so when you pick up those little chocolates, you just understand how special they are by the way that they look and how much care was put into crafting the appearance. We use about two to three different types of milk chocolate, usually one to two maybe three white chocolates, and we have about eight to 10 dark chocolates that we use that we can choose to blend from and go from there. We use the polycarbonate molds like this, and so, for instance, say if this were the Bananas Foster, we will speckle it with a dark color, and then we come back and use an airbrush and spray the colored cocoa butter on the inside of the mold. And then you put the chocolate in. Right. So behind me is a molding machine, and what's happening is perfectly tempered chocolate is pouring out through that spout so that no matter when they're accessing this chocolate, it's at perfect temper, which is critical to getting that signature shine that's on the surface of those beautiful Christopher Elbow truffles. The process of developing our flavors happens several different ways. My, you know, when I travel, when I'm at a restaurant, when I'm at a grocery store or a market, I'm always thinking about, you know, ingredients and would this work with chocolate. I would say one thing that we're somewhat, I think, known for is not getting too crazy with our flavors. Sure, rosemary might sound weird, but it makes sense. You know, it works. Uh, we don't do things for the sake of being trendy or the sake of, of just um, kind of shock value. If you know, we want somebody to eat the chocolate, enjoy it, and want another one. One important part of our business right now is our relationships with uh, the companies where we get our chocolate from. That doesn't always show to the consumer with what we do because they look at this box of chocolate, so it's really beautiful, but there's a huge story about what's inside that box. A lot of people don't really understand they see a chocolate bar, but they don't put a lot of thought into you know, what it's taken for that chocolate bar to get in front of them. I wake up every day and, and can't believe how far this has come. Uh, we feel very fortunate that 
the city got behind us, you know, kind of pinch myself and very excited to always see what, what the next day or what the next step is. making today is a mole, a chicken mole. This one does include chocolate as one of its main ingredients and I'm going to be using this Tanzanian 72% uh, dark chocolate from our friends at Askinosi as that final touch on this very complicated sauce. So I'm going to be pairing it with a Norton and this particular Norton is from Cave Vineyards which is in the St. Genevieve region so it's going to be a great pair with this. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to toast up these chilies in a dry skillet and then I'm going to pour some boiling water over top of it to kind of soften all of that up. So I have three different types of peppers, fasilla peppers, guajillo peppers, and then chipotles. My water's at the boil, just about ready, and I can tell because the seeds that have fallen out of the peppers are getting nice and toasty. So I'm gonna put this in a heat-proof bowl and I'm just gonna pour this over top. I'm just gonna put it aside and let it sit. I'm gonna go ahead and get the chicken thighs started. And I'm using chicken thighs with the skin because they have a really great flavor and texture. And so I'm just gonna heat up a little bit of oil in my pan. Go ahead and season them up with some salt and pepper. What I want is to caramelize the skin and help render out some of that fat. So I want it to get nice and brown, but not cooked all the way through. So I'm gonna go ahead and chop up a white onion, one tomato, a couple of tomatillos, and then a few cloves of garlic. I'm gonna stick that in the oven just to get these things all nicely caramelized. So I have all of my ingredients here. I'm not gonna oil it. I'm just gonna pop them in the oven for a quick, high heat cook at about 450 degrees. My last round of chicken thighs is beautifully golden. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is put that first batch back in the pot, along with any of the accumulated juices. All that good stuff that's accumulated. You don't wanna throw that away, get it back in the pan. Just a couple cups of orange juice, and then just a little bit of chicken stock as well. It's gonna give kind of a sweet acidity to the final sauce. I'm gonna turn up my heat just a little bit so I can bring this to a simmer, and I'm gonna go check the veg that's in the oven. Yeah, I'm gonna call that done. These look delicious. So I'm gonna transfer all these guys into my blender. Mmm, smells fantastic. All right, I'm just gonna put this in a bowl real quick, and then I'm gonna go ahead and puree all of those chilies that have been soaking in that hot water. These chilies have been soaking for a good amount of time. They're really, really soft. And I'm gonna transfer them into the blender along with this liquid, because so much of the flavor has accumulated in that water. I'm gonna start out with some of the water because I don't want it to be too soupy. I think I'm at a good texture. This is gorgeous looking. It's velvety, beautiful. So I'm gonna pour this into the bowl. Let me give this a quick taste. Mm. Yeah, it's hot and smoky. Ooh, that's hot, that's good. Purees are sitting over here. I'm just gonna put a tiny, tiny bit of oil. This is grapeseed oil. So now I'm gonna go ahead and toast up all the spices. I'm gonna start with five little allspice berries. I have a couple of star anise, a little bit of coriander. You can see already that those guys are starting to cook. I'm gonna do half a teaspoon of cumin and a cinnamon stick. We're gonna use 12 peppercorns and then two cloves. Oh my goodness, these smell so good. I'm gonna toast all of this up, so I'm gonna Turn the heat up just a little bit, and then I'm gonna add in half of this plantain. Chop this guy up, toss him in the pan. Just going with half. Stir that, and then I'm going to add in one tortilla, one corn tortilla specifically. So next addition is a third of a cup of sesame seeds and a half cup of sliced almonds. Well, almond escaped, it means I get to eat it. I'm amping up the heat just a little bit because I do want to develop a little bit of toastiness on these ingredients. I'm adding in a quarter cup of raisins, and then the fabulous purees that I've made. 
Now I mentioned that the chili sauce is pretty hot, so I'm not gonna add all of it. I'm going to add some, and then I'm gonna taste and adjust from there. It has some heat, but it could definitely use some more. Make it to your own taste. I'm gonna let this simmer for roughly 15 minutes or so to kind of soften up those raisins and meld all the flavors. And then this also is going into the food processor. All right, I think we're there. And we're looking really smooth, that's beautiful. Now I'm just gonna take my puree over to my pot of simmering chicken. Just think about all the layers of flavor. And of course, once this is all stirred in, I'm gonna taste and I'm gonna adjust the seasoning. So just carefully blend this together. And then once it's fully incorporated, this is going to simmer for another 15 minutes or so until all the flavors are fully developed. And that's when we're gonna add the chocolate. 15 minutes or so have elapsed. All right, so now this is our chocolate bar from Eskinozzi. And it is a dark chocolate bar. I'm gonna let it melt and then I'll kind of fold it in. I wanna be really careful so that I don't kind of destroy the, the flavor and the texture of the chocolate. So, all right, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna let this sit for just a second. I'm gonna pop a couple of these corn tortillas onto this griddle, kind of warm them up. I have my corn tortillas. They smell lovely right off the griddle. And then dig out some of those gorgeous chicken thighs. So the last little bit is to put some chopped cilantro on top along with just a few sesame seeds. Pairing this rich and delicious dish with a Norton. This one, as I mentioned, is from K Vineyards in St. Jen. And I'm using Norton for this dish because Norton has a very rich and very forward character and so does this mole. It's gonna be a perfect pair with our mole, which is such a fun way to use chocolate. And so this is a very fitting end, I think, to our chocolate episode where we show all the different ways that chocolate is being played with across the region. So cheers, and I'll see you next time.